Douglas Edwards at Relay House, midway between Baltimore and Ellicott's Mills, here on the first completed section of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. All scheduled horse cars have been canceled because today, on this 28th of August, 1830, the first passenger carrying steam locomotive built in the United States, Mr. Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb, is to have its initial public demonstration. From all the surrounding countryside, a crowd of curious, excited people have gathered here at Relay House. August 28, 1830. Trial run of the Tom Thumb, Peter Cooper's steam locomotive. You are there. The first steam locomotive ever built in the United States is demonstrated to the public and is challenged to a race with a horse-drawn carriage. CBS takes you back 119 years to an historic occasion in the development of American transportation. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. With all the modern facilities of radio present and CBS newsmen reporting from the scene, You are there. You are there is based on historical fact and quotation. And now, 1830, Relay House... On the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and Douglas Edwards. We are expecting the arrival of the Tom Tom at any moment. This morning, Mr. Peter Cooper ran his steam locomotive along the rails of the Baltimore and Ohio to Ellicott's Mills. That's a distance of some 18 miles from Baltimore. According to the schedule, he is now headed back towards Baltimore. And here at Relay House, the point where Norm Ohio switched teams, a festive crowd has assembled. They're here for the most part out of curiosity. Some are inclined to regard this whole occasion as a lark, an event of no import at all, except perhaps if the tom-tom blows itself off the rails, a contingency they regard as highly likely. The tom-tom is not yet in sight, but Ned Kelmer is aboard the steam locomotive. Perhaps he can tell us when it will arrive. Come in, tom-tom. Come in, Ned Kelmer, aboard the steam locomotive, the tom-tom. Hello, Doug. Hello, Doug Edwards. I don't know precisely where we are. I should say not more than a mile or two from Relay House. You can expect us within a few minutes, I'm sure. Yes, Mr. Cooper just nodded as I said that. A few minutes, Doug, that's about all. Right now I'm standing next to Mr. Cooper at 12 miles an hour. I know that sounds incredible, but we've been maintaining this pace for two, sometimes even three minutes at a stretch. Of course, we do slow down quite a bit for the curves, but it's almost impossible to describe the acceleration, the thrill of rocketing along at this speed of 12 miles an hour. It's, it's difficult to even talk. I've, I've got one hand grasping the railing here, my, my other clutching the microphone. You can probably hear the whine of the wind streaking by. I'll be singing in a matter of minutes. And now back to Doug Edwards at Relay House. We see no sign as yet of the Tom Thumb here at Relay House, but Bill Leonard is atop the little round station house, and uh, he'll let us know the moment he spots the Tom Thumb down the tracks. Here, standing next to me, is a gentleman who's probably more concerned than anyone about the outcome of this trial run, the president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, Mr. Philip E. Thomas. Mr. Thomas, it's a great turnout, isn't it? Fine. Splendid. I <laughs> gratify that the people here have taken such an interest in our endeavor. The Baltimore and Ohio is now in its second year, isn't that right? Yes, our second year. The first stone on our railroad was uh, put down July the 4th, 1828. Of course, at that time, we planned only for horse cars. Mr. Thomas, what gave you the idea of building your railroad to the west? Well, Mr. Edwards, I'll be nothing but honest with you. The idea was born of necessity. At one time, as you know, Baltimore was the eastern terminus of the highway to the west. Uh, the National Road. But the opening of the Erie Canal in New York State five years ago has drained an enormous amount of commerce out of our city. To regain our trade, we have planned this railroad. And now you're considering the possibility of steam locomotives to supplant the horse cars. Uh, In that connection, what about the statement of George Stevenson, the eminent English authority, that steam locomotives will jump the track going around sharp curves unless they slow down to a walk? Well, we hope to have the answer to that today. There's a very sharp curve at Point of Rocks between here and Baltimore, and 
We'll see what happens. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Uh, just a moment, please. Well, I can tell by the crowd it's coming, the tongue thumb. From where we stand, we can't see anything, but Bill Renner, the top relay house. Can you see Mr. Cooper's steam locomotive? It's not the Tom Thumb, Doug. It's not the Tom Thumb. It's coming from the direction of Baltimore and not from Ellicott's Mills. And it's not a steam locomotive. It's a regular horse car that's coming down the rails. I have no idea what it's doing here. Maybe Mr. Thomas can explain it. Well, what do you say, Mr. Thomas? Why, this this is very strange. All traffic has been suspended. Uh, I, will, will you excuse me for a moment? I'd like to look into this matter. Pardon me. Certainly, Mr. Thomas. Meanwhile, I think it would be interesting now to see how some of the spectators here feel about the idea of traveling by steam locomotion. Don Hollenbeck is among the crowd alongside the track, so over to Don Hollenbeck. I have a gentleman here, Doug. What's your name, sir, please? My name is Hadley, sir. Phineas A. Hadley, the feed and grain business. Well, sir, just what do you think of the possibility of traveling by steam at speeds as great as 12 or even 15 miles an hour? Well, sir, I think it's awful. The whole country is in danger, that's what I say. All this worry about speed. <laughs> Why, it won't be able to keep an apprentice boy at work if this keeps up. Every Saturday evening, he'll get a buck to take a trip to Ohio to spend a Sunday with his sweetheart. Grave citizens will be flying about like comets. Why, sir, the entire gravity of the nation will be upset. Upon the whole, sir, I regard this project as a pestilential, topsy-turvy, harem scarum whirly gate. Well, Mr. Hadley, you Yes, think... sir, give me the old straightforward way with a fine horse for a journey and a yoke of oxen for heavy loads. Me, I go for beasts of burden. Yes, they suit a moral and religious people better. Thank you very much, Mr. Hadley. And now back to Doug Edwards. Bill Leonard on the roof of the station house is called for the air. He may have news for us. All right, Bill Leonard. She's coming. She's coming. I can see the Tom Thumb. It's just puffing its way around the bend, and I can see the carriage it's pulling. It seems to be literally hurtling in this direction. Smoke is pouring out of its stacks. It's coming on fast. The Tom Thumb will soon be here. Doug Edwards has a better view, I believe, down there on the platform, so back to Doug Edwards. Yes, Bill, we can see it now. The crowd has spotted the Tom Thumb. I judge it's still at least a quarter of a mile away, but it's coming on fast. And by a strange contrast from the other direction, the unexplained horse-drawn carriage is speeding along the parallel set of rails. Both will probably arrive at Relay House at just about the same time. It's an impressive sight, the old and the new, the tried and the untried, both speeding towards Relay House, both converging on this point. But here comes Mr. Thomas again. What did you find out, Mr. Thomas? This horse car coming in from Baltimore, it's very strange. Uh, not the scheduled run, of course. Uh, the man at the reins is Mr. Thomas Stokes himself, one of the partners in the firm of Stockton and Stokes, the stage proprietors of supplies with our horses. It's most unusual. Perhaps he may be coming up to see how the Tom Thumb performs. Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, excuse me. Now, from the other direction, aboard the Tom Thumb, we can make out now... Uh, it's Mr. Cooper standing on the platform, and we can see the people in the open carriage behind. They're waving, evidently in high good spirits. There's the whistle. Perhaps you heard it over the noise of the crowd. The Tom Thumb is coming on smoothly now, slowing its speed. The little locomotive looks no bigger than a hand cart. The boiler is set in its middle. The boiler, I'd say, is about three feet high. There's the whistle again. Listen now, listen. I'm sure you can hear the sound of the locomotive. It's coming into the station. surging towards it. The police are trying to hold them back, but it's no use. They've run onto the roadbed. They've got the steam locomotive completely surrounded. The passengers can't get off the carriage. We're going to try to get to Ned Calmer, who, as you know, has been aboard the Tom Thumb. We want him to bring Mr. Cooper to the microphone. But at the moment, I can see that uh, 
Both Ned and Mr. Cooper are very much occupied trying to keep from being pulled off the locomotive by this wildly enthusiastic crowd. It seems that, uh, well, Mr. Stokes, Mr. Stokes, please. I'm trying to get to Mr. Thomas Stokes, who just came up with his horse car, to Mr. Stokes, uh, this is CBS. We've been wondering about you, sir, wondering why you came here to Relay House, even though traffic had been suspended on the railroad. Would you mind telling us the reason? No, sir, don't mind telling you. Don't mind telling everybody. Matter of fact, that's just what I intend doing. Just let me get up on the bench here for a moment. All right, be careful. Quiet well down now, everybody. You hear me? Let me say something. Quiet well down, will you? Listen now. Everybody, listen. You folks out there all know me. Yeah, we know you, Tom. Oh, good, maybe don't. I'm Tom Stokes, head of the firm of Stockton and Stokes, owners of the strongest horses from Maine to Georgia. Anyone want to argue that point? Seems like nobody's argumentable. Now then, I'm not there, tea kettle. <laughs> Mr. Peter Cooper, can you hear me? All right, Mr. Cooper, listen to this. That there horse yonder is by name of Betsy. And I ain't saying she's the fastest piece of horse flesh hereabouts. And I ain't saying she isn't. But I am saying, Mr. Peter Cooper, that that there old gray mare of mine can beat the charcoal stubborn out of that overgrown foot warmer you call a, uh, locomotive. <laughs> I say she can do it. And I stand here ready to prove it. Mr. Peter Cooper, me and my man challenge you and your pot boiler to a race from here in Baltimore. It's a challenge, sir. You accept? It's a challenge. Mr. Peter Cooper to Baltimore. The crowd seems hugely pleased with this idea. They're begging Peter Cooper to accept. I see that uh, Mr. Cooper has come down off the Tom Tom now. He's headed this way. The crowd is urging him to accept the challenge. Right now, here they are. Mr. Cooper, Mr. Thomas, everyone around is grinning. Except Mr. Cooper. He looks very tense, very somber. Mr. Stokes has jumped down from the bench. Here he is. Uh, Cooper, let's say, will you race? Will you take up my challenge? Well, now, this is most unexpected. Uh, Mr. Thomas, you're president of the line. What do you say? Well, Cooper, I leave that up to you. The decision is yours. Go on, Mr. Cooper. Go well, on. Will you test your perambulating smokestack against solid horse flesh? What do you say, Cooper? Very well. I accept. <laughs> Mr. Cooper has taken up the challenge. He will race his steam locomotive against the horse. We race even, start even. Finish line to be Pot Street Station in Baltimore. Agreed. Each to draw one carriage with 15 passengers. Agreed. I'll need a few minutes to replenish my water supply and fuel. Take all the time you need. I'll have my nail and hitched and turn around. Now, sir, perhaps you'd like to put down a little wager on the outcome? I'm sorry, Mr. Stokes. I'm not a betting man. Or is a pity. But I tell you this, Mr. Peter Cooper. By the time that there contraption of yours crawls its way into Baltimore, I'll have my mare better down for the night. And myself... I'll be down in my fifth pint at Bull's Head Carriage. Mr. Cooper and Mr. Stokes are now going their separate ways to make the necessary preparations for their race. The crowd now, sensing the drama of the moment, has quieted down just a bit. They seem to be splitting into two sections. The backers of Mr. Stokes' gray mare are flocking over to the far rail where the horse-drawn carriage is standing, while the enthusiasts of the Tom Thumb are crowding around the steam locomotive. The race will get underway in a few minutes, we expect, and we're making arrangements to bring you CBS coverage every step of the way from here into Baltimore. Ned Calmer will remain at his post aboard the locomotive right alongside Mr. Cooper. Bill Leonard will ride on Mr. Stokes' horse-drawn carriage. The shortwave equipment is being set up. Now, while we're waiting, let's ask him how things are going. Bill? Well, Doug, we're just about set here. We're surrounded by quite a crowd of well wishes. They're all very easily helping unhitch the mare and turn her around. I might say she's a fine, gallant gray horse, one of the most powerful looking I've ever seen. She's drawing a standard railroad car. 
wooden benches for the passengers, and a striped canvas canopy set on eight poles over the open carriage. Matter of fact, it's practically identical with the carriage behind Mr. Cooper's steam locomotive. Mr. Stokes seems to have finished his preparations now. Uh, Mr. Stokes, Mr. Stokes, sir, uh, judging from our challenge, it seems that you don't believe that the steam locomotive will ever replace your horses. No, sir, I don't. Not that I'm old-fashioned. Why, when the first steamboat started coming into use 15, 20 years ago, I was all for it. On water, a steam engine's fine. But on land, it takes four solid hooves to get you where you're going. But, Mr. Stokes, sir, Mr. Cooper claims his steam locomotive is faster, more economical, and gets you anywhere without regard to rough terrain. Ah, poppycock. Besides, there's something else Mr. Cooper forgets. Let me tell you this. Scientists say that when anything goes around a curve at 15 miles in an hour, there's no telling what will happen. Something called centrifugal force, I think it is. Whatever it is, it'll smash a person's bones to smithereens. Crush them like nothing at all. Well, thank you, Mr. Stokes. Thank you, sir. And now in the last few moments before the race gets underway, let's see how Mr. Cooper's preparations are progressing. So over to the Tom Thumb and Ned Kelmer. I'm standing here on the open deck of the Tom Thumb, and I'm going to try to get Mr. Cooper to answer a few questions. Mr. Peter Cooper was known in New York City, you know, as a successful merchant before he became interested in the development of steam locomotion. All right. Mr. Cooper, sir, can you spare us a moment now? Yes, of course. I, I wonder if you would explain the operation of your steam locomotive to somebody who, unfortunately, doesn't have your mechanical knowledge. Well, it's quite simple. Now, the lower portion of this boiler here is the firebox. Yeah. The upper portion is filled with water, which is boiled into steam. I see. Now, the steam moves through these pipes here into this cylinder. I had quite a problem with those pipes, incidentally. No iron pipe of any kind was manufactured in the United States, you know. Had to improvise a bit. Bought up some old muskets. Removed the barrels, and I had my pipe. Uh, that's certainly very ingenious, Mr. Cooper. Now, to provide a draft for my firebox, I have developed this floor here, driven by this cord attached to one of the car wheels. Uh, Sam, better tighten the cord. looks a little slack. Now, uh, under here... You can see the gears that transfer the up and down action of the engine into a rotary action that turns the wheel. Uh, one last question, Mr. Cooper. Do you intend to take the curve at Point of Rocks at full speed? Well, that will depend on how the race is going. We shall see you when we get there. We shall see. Mr. Cooper, uh, are you ready? Pardon me. Uh, in a moment or two, Mr. Thomas, we're getting out of steam. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. The race will be off in a matter of seconds now. So, back to the platform and plug it. The tracks are being cleared now. The Tom Thumb and Mr. Stokes' horse car are lined up side by side on the parallel tracks. A tense silence has fallen over the crowd. I'm standing right next to Mr. Philip E. Thomas, president of the Baltimore and Ohio, who's going to give the starting signal. Gentlemen, when I uh, drop my handkerchief, It'll be the signal to go. I'll count three. The first into Pratt Street Station is the winner. Are you ready, Mr. Stokes? Ready. Are you ready, Mr. Cooper? Ready. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> But the locomotive barely moves. It just crawls. But the Tom Thumb is moving very slowly, very slowly. Ned, Ned Kelmer, what seems to be the trouble? It seems we don't have full steam up yet, Doug. Mr. Cooper is pouring coal into the firebox here, working the fellows to get trapped. And now we are moving a little faster, maybe two or three miles an hour. But the horse carriage is way out in front. It's already reached the first little rise. As I watch, it appears to be sailing right over it, right over the hill, and just about out of sight. But we are out of the station now, and we're definitely on our way. Bill Leonard, how are things on the horse car? Bill Leonard. Mr. Stokes has our mayor settled down to a straw, but he's in charge 
thought we're spinning along at a speed that I'd gauge at perhaps uh, six or seven miles an hour, smoothly rolling over the rails. Back in the carriage here, the company is in high good spirits. You can probably hear them, and everyone is looking back, but there's no sign at all of the Tom Thumb. It doesn't seem to be in this race at all. Right now, we're, we're coming up to the curve at the point of rocks. Mr. Stokes has the mare in hand, just slackening the speed a bit. Not, not much. The men in the carriage are gripping the handrail, waiting to take the curve. And, and now we're, we're on it. We're on the curve. We're, we're taking it easily, just a little sway. Not much, but we're going around smoothly, easily. And we're past now. We're past it on a stretch. And I'm breaking the track. Stokes is flying the silk again, just okay. touching the mare, and she responds beautifully. She's really going along now, and still we can't see the Tom Thumb. Ned Calmer, Ned Calmer on the Tom Thumb, what's happened? Are, are you folks still in the race? Come in, Ned Calmer. Don't worry about us, Bill. We're coming on. We're really hitting our stride now. Took the little Tom Thumb a few minutes to get her breath, but... She's got the bit in her teeth now. We've left the crowd far behind the really house, and at the moment, we're rocketing along at a speed that I guess to be well over 15 miles an hour, may, maybe as high as 18. The gentlemen back in the carriage are all holding the handrails in one hand, the uh, hats with the other. They, they look a little grim, a little fearful, and believe me, I know exactly how they feel. They all, we're coming up to the point of rocks. It's right ahead of us now. And Mr. Cooper is making no effort to slow down the speed of the Tom Thumb. He, he's going to take the curve at full speed. Full speed. This will be the test. We'll know now. Can a locomotive shoot around a sharp curve without breaking itself? We're going to find out. Now we're at point of starting to veer. Turn. This is Doug Edwards at Relay House. Come in, Ned Calmer. Come in, Ned Calmer. Ned Calmer on the Tom Thumb. Are you all right? What's happened? Come in. Come in, Ned Calmer. Ladies and gentlemen, we've lost our signal from the Tom Thumb. We don't know what's happened. As you heard, the locomotive was taking the curve at full speed. That's a tremendous gamble by Mr. Cooper. A desperate attempt to catch up with a horse car. But it seems that... Hello, Doug. Hello, Doug Edwards. Hello, Ned. That's all right. All right, go ahead. What happened? We're all right. We were cut off a moment. Our microphone connection worked loose because of the vibration of the engine, but the main thing is we made it. We made it around the curve. The locomotive and the carriage swayed violently, but we stayed on the rails. We flew, but a steam locomotive can take a sharp curve at full speed at, at 15 or even 18 miles an hour. And now we're really bearing down on that horse carriage. Only yards separate us. The horse car seems almost to be standing still as we roar down. I can see Mr. Stokes flying his whip madly. The mare has gone for the dog spot into almost a gallop, and yet it's no use. We're getting up. Almost up to it. Something's the matter. A 
Give it a go. We were going along beautifully. And now, the engine has begun to ease its back up to the ground. We're slowing up. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper, what's happened? The blower cord has slipped off the pulley. I'm going to try to get it back. Don't do it, Mr. Cooper. It's spinning too fast. It's hot. Oh, what else, Sam? Let me try to reach down for it. Look, what's your hand? Mr. Cooper was trying to fix the blower cord, and his hand has been lacerated, but... He doesn't seem to be badly hurt. We're, we're stopping. We're stopped. And here comes the horse car. Here it comes, bearing down on us. Mr. Cooper, bad hand of our horse, seems, seems to be determined to get the locomotive into action again. But he jumps in his horse car, coming up, passing us, while we're stalled. Help us. Right by, right past him. Mr. Cooper's face is ashen white. He's obviously in pain, but he and his assistant are at the mechanism, yanking at the wheels and pulleys. Mr. Cooper, is it possible? Can you get the Tom Thumb going again? I don't know. Flying, doing everything. Stand, put wood on the fire. Try wood, hurry. They're trying to build steam pressure here with wood instead of coal, but already the horse carriage has turned down into Pratt Street. It's well into town. Bill Leonard, exactly where are you now? Come in, Bill Leonard. series You Are There. Today's program was written by Irv Tunick, directed by John Dietz, and produced by the CBS Documentary Unit under the supervision of Werner Michel. Peter Cooper was played by Carl Frank. Santos Ortega was John Stokes. Nelson Olmsted was Philippe Thomas. And Arthur Vinton was Phineas Hadley. Sam was played by Guy Sorrell. The sound effects of a locomotive heard on this broadcast were the authentic sounds of the Tom Thumb, and were especially recorded for You Are There in Baltimore. The next broadcast of You Are There will be heard at this time Sunday, December 25th, four weeks from today, over many of these same stations. Next month, Christmas Day, 800 A.D., Pope Leo III offers Charlemagne the crown of the Roman Empire. You are there. And tonight there's a program filled with youthful talent and fun. A program designed for all of you who like to see youngsters get a chance at the big break. It's Horace Height's original Youth Opportunity Program, broadcast over many of these same CBS stations every Sunday night. Be sure you're on hand tonight for the Horace Height original Youth Opportunity Program on CBS. This is CBS. Hear Horace Height every Sunday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>